This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 65. Coming up on Space Time, space junk collides with the International Space Station. The most precise look yet at the universe's evolution. And NASA's new Viper lunar rover. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The International Space Station has been hit by space junk. The piece of space debris has left a hole in a section of the orbiting outpost robotic arm. The damage to one of the boom sections of the Canada Arm 2 was detected by the Canadian Space Agency during a routine inspection. Mission managers from the Canadian Space Agency and NASA worked together to take detailed images of the area and assess the impact. Luckily, the 5mm impact hole missed vital systems, and the robotic arm is still operational, with damage limited to a small section of the arm boom and thermal blanket. The Canada Arm 2 is a 17.6 metre long robotic arm, hinged in the middle and equipped with hand-like latching end effectors at each end. This allows it to move across the external structure of the space station, moving equipment, carrying out servicing operations, undertaking repairs, and even capturing spacecraft and manoeuvring them into docking ports. The problem of space junk's getting worse. The space station is now being forced to move regularly to avoid passing space junk, but some pieces are simply too small to be tracked from Earth. Current estimates suggest there are more than 200 million bits of space junk, a few centimetres or less in size, orbiting the Earth. These objects are travelling at speeds of 28,000 kilometres an hour or faster, meaning closing speeds of over 56,000 kilometres per hour. And the big fear remains cascade events, where satellites, spent rocket stages or bits of space junk slam into each other creating more space junk, which then slams into other spacecraft, creating even more space debris and so on. Ultimately, the Earth could face what's being referred to as a Kessler syndrome. First proposed by NASA scientist Donald Kessler back in 1978, the Kessler syndrome involves a runaway chain reaction of collisions, exponentially increasing the amount of debris clouds orbiting the Earth to the point where the distribution of debris could render space activities and the use of satellites in specific orbital ranges impractical for generations. This is Space Time. Still to come, the Dark Energy Survey providing the most precise look ever at the universe's evolution and NASA's Viper Lunar Rover. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The Dark Energy Survey has released its first three years of data, including observations of some 226 million galaxies, covering over an eighth of the sky. The data, contained in 29 new scientific papers, examines the largest ever maps of galaxy distribution and shapes, extending more than 7 billion light-years across the universe. The extraordinarily precise analysis contributes to the most powerful test so far of the standard cosmological model, science's best understanding of the universe on cosmic scales. However, hints remain from earlier dark energy survey data and other experiments that matter in the universe today is a few percent less clumpy than what's predicted. Still, the new results are producing the most precise measurements to date of the universe's composition and growth. The Dark Energy Survey images the night sky using the 570 megapixel Dark Energy Camera located on the National Science Foundation's 4-metre telescope at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. One of the most powerful digital cameras in the world, the Dark Energy Camera was designed specifically for this massive survey. It was funded by the US Department of Energy and was built and tested by Fermilab. Over the course of six years, from 2013 through to 2019, the Dark Energy Survey used some 30% of all telescope time at the Blanco Telescope, surveying some 5,000 square degrees, almost one-eighth of the entire sky. 
It took 758 nights of observation time, cataloguing literally hundreds of millions of objects. Since the Dark Energy Survey studied both nearby galaxies as well as those billions of light years away, its maps provide a snapshot of both the current large-scale structure of the universe and a view of how that structure has evolved over the past 7 billion years. That's half the age of the universe. Ordinary matter makes up about 5% of the universe. That's the stuff stars and planets and people are made out of. Dark energy, which cosmologists hypothesize drives the accelerating expansion of the universe by counteracting the force of gravity, accounts for about 70% of the mass energy budget of the universe. And the remaining 25% is dark matter, a mysterious invisible substance whose gravitational influence binds galaxies together. The problem is both dark matter and dark energy remain largely unknown, hence the term dark. And the Dark Energy Survey seeks to illuminate their nature by studying how the competition between dark energy and dark matter shapes the large-scale structure of the universe over cosmic timescales. To quantify the distribution of dark matter and the effect of dark energy, the survey relied mainly on two phenomena. First, on large scales, galaxies aren't distributed randomly through space, but rather form a web-like structure of strands and interconnecting nodes due to the gravity of dark matter. The Dark Energy Survey measured how this cosmic web has evolved over the history of the universe. The galaxy clustering that forms this cosmic web in turn revealed the regions with a high density of dark matter. Now, secondly, the Dark Energy Survey detected the signature of dark matter through weak gravitational lensing. As light from a distant galaxy travels through space, the gravity of both ordinary foreground matter and dark matter will bend its path, as if through a lens, resulting in a distorted image of the galaxy as seen from Earth. By studying how the apparent shapes of distant galaxies are aligned with each other and with the position of nearby galaxies along the line of sight, scientists were able to infer the clumpiness of the dark matter of the universe. To test cosmologists' current model of the universe, Dark Energy Survey scientists compared their results with measurements from the European Space Agency's orbiting Planck Observatory. Planck has used light known as the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation in order to peer back to the very early universe, to a time just 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the first atoms were formed and the first photons escaped. So this means that Planck's given a precise view of the universe 13.8 billion years ago, and the standard cosmological model predicts how dark matter should evolve into the present time. Combined with the earlier results, the Dark Energy Survey provides the most powerful test of the current best model of the universe to date, and the results are consistent with the prediction of the standard model of cosmology. However, hints still remain from the Dark Energy Survey and several previous galaxy surveys that the universe today is a few percent less clumpy than predicted. This report from Fermilab. The Night Sky People have studied it for millennia, seeking to unlock its secrets. We've come a long way in our understanding, and in the process, we've uncovered a surprising truth. Everything that we see, the stars, planets, life, makes up only about 5% of the stuff in the universe. Roughly 25% is what we call dark matter, holding galaxies together through gravity. The last 70% is known as dark energy, accelerating the expansion of the universe. Building on Einstein's theory of general relativity, scientists have ideas about how dark matter and dark energy affect the universe, and they can test their predictions without knowing the identities of these mysterious substances. The way that structures form in our universe is very sensitive to the proportions of and characteristics of dark matter and dark energy. Without a certain amount of dark matter, there wouldn't have been enough mass in the early stages of the universe to form structures like galaxies that are very comfortable hosts that we live in. But without a specific percentage of dark energy, there might have been too much structure. So we need a very precise balance to be able to make the universe that we observe. There seem to be some interesting tensions between observations that we've made of the early light in the universe, like the cosmic microwave background, and observations that we make 
of the local universe, so what's really near to us. We have a hint, however, that the local measurements give slightly different values. So the question is, is that real? Now, new results from the Dark Energy Survey take us one step closer to figuring out how the universe got to be the way it is and what the future has in store. The Dark Energy Survey is an international collaboration that aims at observing hundreds of millions of galaxies and taking pictures of them. The primary science goal of the project is to study the distribution of galaxies in space, and that helps us better understand the expansion of the universe, um, and that's related to dark energy. The multinational project led by Fermilab is based at the National Science Foundation's Blanco Telescope at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. Over more than 300 nights, the survey charted about one-eighth of the whole sky and includes the largest sample of galaxies ever used for cosmology, over 226 million of them. The lens of the dark energy camera is more than three feet and it can take pictures with a whopping 570 megapixels. This is far beyond the capabilities of our iPhone, which takes at most 12 megapixels. One of the primary reasons we have our telescope in Chile is because they have these very tall mountains where the atmosphere is, relatively speaking, more stable. So the light as it passes through the atmosphere is going to be deflected less. In the Dark Energy Survey, we use several probes, but the most powerful of them are galaxy clustering and weak gravitational lensing. Galaxy clustering, it's sort of just is a, is a name for the fact that galaxies, they aren't distributed sort of uniformly randomly in space. They, they exist in a web, and that's what we observe. We observe this web. And more clustered galaxies allude to more dark matter in that region. So the galaxies serve to illuminate the dark matter scaffolding. Weak gravitational lensing, it's a, a name for an effect that we can use to help understand dark matter and dark energy. I have a wine glass here, and the wine glass uh, bends the light that passes through it. If I put like the, the base of this wine glass on the camera, you see that the image um, is going to be distorted. And importantly, that uh, as I move the, the wine glass away, you see the amount of distortion changes, and that's exactly what we're studying with the Dark Energy Survey. Figuring out those patterns is a complicated process. It's a bit like looking at an abstract painting and figuring out the order in which the layers were painted. To do weak lensing and clustering, we need to understand how far away the galaxies are, so the distances from Earth to the galaxies. And we call this the redshift. So the higher a redshift a galaxy has, the further away it is from us. So redshift refers to um, the change in the color of light. So light has been shifted to be more red. When a galaxy is moving towards you, it would be it would appear bluer for this reason. And when it's moving away from you, it appears redder. Redshift then is a measure of the velocity of an object relative to you. In the Dark Energy Survey, we make photometric observations. So we observe each galaxy in different filters on our camera, and that allows us to pick up different features and measure the colors of these galaxies, which we use to determine their distances. We need to measure how far these are with extreme precision, otherwise we can get uh, biased results and then won't, won't matter. The Dark Energy Survey gives us a clearer picture of our universe than ever before. The results of our analysis are as impressive as the road to get there. We found that our measurements are well described by predictions that we make from the standard model of cosmology. Measurements of the early universe are an exquisite fit to this model, but they probe the universe at an unrecognizable stage when it's just a plasma of particles. Very different to the one that we observe with the Dark Energy Survey, which is teeming with galaxies and dark energy. So it's a beautiful test and a remarkable feat that one theory can describe billions of years of cosmic evolution. Now, our analysis best measures how clumpy the matter in the universe is. And it is intriguing that our measurements find slightly less clumpiness than what the early universe dictates. So although our standard model survives a more stringent test than ever before, there is enough ambiguity to keep us looking up. Now, the Dark Energy Survey has double the amount of data still to be analyzed. So 
we're really just at the beginning of learning what we can from the darkness, and that's exciting. The Dark Energy Survey has already done a lot of great science. Now, with the three-year analysis completed, the best is still to come. The survey lasted six years in total. To unpack the full data set, the team will harness all the sophisticated methods that they've developed so far. In the process, they'll nail down the distribution of dark matter and dark energy with even greater precision. And in that report from Fermilab, we heard from Dark Sky Survey scientist Andrea Amon, Justin Miles, and Giulia Giannini. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA introduces its lunar Viper rover and a Chinese supply ship docks to Beijing's new space station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, Namecheap.com. As their slogan says, search and buy domains from Namecheap at the lowest prices. Now, this is the service that our team at Bytes.com use to buy and manage our domain names, and we're really happy with the service support and value we're getting. Buying the right domain name shouldn't be hard, and with Namecheap, we've found it to be anything but that. And you can find your dream domain and join over 2 million happy customers when you register with Namecheap. Trusted with well over 10 million domains, you'll know you're in safe hands when it comes to turning your website idea into reality. And they've got some excellent tools to help you find the right name, like the handy search engine. All you do is type in your desired name, cross your fingers and press search. And if what you want's already gone, and it does happen sometimes, they'll come up with some great alternative ideas. And if you're looking for some new inspiration, try the new website domain name finder, Beast Mode. It'll help you discover thousands of domain names fast. We've found their prices to be excellent, management tools intuitive, and they're easy to use with excellent custom support if you need it. All in all, it's a great experience all round if you're looking to pick up a domain name or two. So, why not check them out and help support our show at the same time? Just visit spacetimewithstuartgary.com forward slash name cheap. That's spacetimewithstuartgary.com forward slash name cheap and name cheap is one word. You'll find the URL details in the show notes and on our website. Just visit the support page. That's spacetimewithstuartgary.com forward slash name cheap. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has announced plans for a new robotic lunar rover, which will land on the moon before the arrival of the first Artemis astronauts in 2024. The Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, will touch down in 2023 and help map resources at the lunar south pole, which could be used for long-term human exploration of the moon. Viper will include the first headlights on an extraterrestrial vehicle, allowing it to explore the dark, permanently shadowed regions on the floors of polar lunar craters which haven't seen sunlight for billions of years. These frozen regions contain huge reserves of water ice, which will help scientists determine where the moon's water came from, and they'll also provide resources for future Artemis crews, including oxygen for breathing, water for drinking, and water for splitting up into hydrogen and oxygen for use as fuel. The four-wheel box-shaped rover will use specialized wheels and suspension systems designed to cover a variety of different terrains in clients and soil types. The solar-powered Viper will be designed to operate for three lunar days. That's 100 Earth days. Its scientific payload will include a regolith and ice hammer drill, a mass spectrometer instrument, a near-infrared volatile spectrometer system, and a neutron spectrometer system. Prototypes of all the science instruments will be tested on the lunar surface next year, ahead of the launch of the Viper mission. NASA's awarded Astrobiotic the contract for Viper's launch and transport to the lunar surface under its Commercial Lunar Payload Services initiative. This is space time. Still to come, China has successfully docked a cargo ship loaded with supplies for the core module of its new space station, And later in the science report, a new study shows that three quarters of all COVID-19 survivors end up with some sort of lingering symptoms. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
China has successfully docked a cargo ship loaded with supplies under the Tianhe core module of Beijing's new space station. A Long March 7 rocket carrying the Tianzhu 2 cargo ship launched two days earlier from the Wengcheng Satellite Launch Center on Henan Island in the South China Sea. The cargo ship was loaded with food, equipment and fuel. China are now planning a manned mission sending three crew members to the orbiting outpost to unpack the newly arrived supplies, which include meals such as shredded pork and garlic sauce and kung pao chicken. Beijing expects to undertake 10 missions to fully assemble its Tiangong or Heavenly Palace space station. The station should become fully operational next year. And once completed, it's expected to remain in low Earth orbit for up to 15 years. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has confirmed earlier suspicions that some three quarters of COVID-19 survivors end up with lingering symptoms. However, a report in the Journal of the American Medical Association warns that the frequency, variety and severity of these complications are not yet well understood. Researchers reviewed 45 studies involving 9,751 participants and found that almost three-quarters of people had at least one persisting symptom. The most frequent symptoms included shortness of breath, fatigue and sleep disorders. However, the studies all differed widely from each other, and so the authors are calling for a longer investigation with similar and repeatable design. The World Health Organization now estimates some 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with over 3.6 million confirmed fatalities and more than 172 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. Despite knowing the strong link between cancer and smoking, a new study has confirmed the number of people consuming tobacco is increasing worldwide. Three papers detailed in the Lancet Medical Journal have found that smoking and tobacco usage are increasing on a global level. The data from 204 countries was compiled through 3,625 nationally representative surveys as part of the Global Burden of Disease study. It found that smoking caused 7.7 million deaths in 2019. It shows that globally 1 in 5 young men and 1 in 20 young women smoke and 9 in 10 current smokers started before the age of 25. On the plus side, over the last 30 years, Australia has decreased its rate of smoking by 47%, putting the land of Oz in the top 10 best performers globally. Paleontologists have identified a new species of hadrosaur duck-billed dinosaur in northern Mexico. A report in the journal Cretaceous Research claims Latilophus galorum roamed the planet during the late Cretaceous between 72 and 73 million years ago. The 12-metre-long herbivore belongs to a group of hadrosaurs with elaborate bony hollow head crests which were over a metre in length and were likely used for communications. A Russian state-based hacking group behind a massive hacking campaign last year has re-emerged with a series of attacks on government agencies, think tanks and consultants, as well as other organisations. A security update from Microsoft warns that the Nobelium hacking group has stepped up its attacks, targeting government agencies involved in foreign policy. The group's been using a sophisticated large-scale campaign that's employed phishing emails, delivering malicious software and enabling hackers to get protected data from victims. Microsoft says the wave of attacks has targeted thousands of email accounts at hundreds of different organizations. Meanwhile, it's been revealed that Russia was also behind the latest spate of cyber attacks targeting the Colonial Gas Pipeline and JBS meat processing operations in the United States and Australia. The criminal hacking group Reveal was behind the ransomware attacks. They're operating freely out of Russia under the protection of Russian intelligence and the Russian government. The colonial gas pipeline attack suspended fuel supplies across the American eastern states. And the attack on JBS halted meat processing at major plants in the United States and Australia. A new cell phone that can be fully charged in 8 minutes and new tower antennas to speed up the 5G rollout. 
With the details on these stories and more, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara Royt from ity.com. Well, what's happening is that they have a custom build of their Xiaomi 11 Pro smartphone, which in its current on-sale edition, uses a um, silicon oxygen negative single-cell battery, and uh, that's the commercially available version. And that actually charges to 100% in just under 24 minutes using a 120-watt wire charger. So that's what's on sale now. But what they demonstrated in a video that you can see online is a 200-watt charger that can charge the battery in just under eight minutes. In fact, a third party also filmed this, and they filmed it charging to 100% in 6 minutes and 55 seconds. But the official stat is 8 minutes. And using a 120-watt wireless charger, they were able to charge that in 15 minutes. And, you know, you're talking about 10% in 44 seconds with the 200-watt wireless charger, 50% in 3 minutes and 22 seconds. And um, with the wireless charger, it gets to 10% in a minute and 14 seconds and 50% in 7 minutes. So these are very fast times. I mean, and it, you know, an example is that the iPhone 12 Pro Max or iPhone 12 Pro using the 20-watt charger that you, ha- that you have to buy separately uh, can recharge the iPhone to 50% in 30 minutes. And using the old-fashioned 5-watt chargers that came with iPhones for many years, it takes three hours and seven minutes to charge an iPhone 12. Now, obviously, different phones have different size batteries, and there are other fast chargers out there for Samsungs and Huawei, which can charge very quickly. Many phones can charge much more quickly than they could in the past, but clearly this decade, we're going to see batteries that I have, in this case, in this special Xiaomi 11 Pro custom build, it's got a graphene-based battery. So we're going to see more advances in battery technology, batteries that can charge super fast, and batteries that will last you know, for up to a week. Or more. I mean, the Holy Grail is a battery that can charge in a few minutes and last, you know, for much longer than the, the day or two we take for granted now. So this is not commercially available yet, but the commercially available version that charges to 100% in 24 minutes is pretty damn fast, and uh, we're only going to see more and more of this in the phones and in the years to come. Now, for a novice like me, what sort of batteries are, are now used in in iPhones and and galaxies and things like that? Are, are they the the same silicon oxygen negative single cell batteries that you're talking about here, or are they? Lithium ion or, or what? Normally they're lithium ion, and there's also something called lithium polymer, which allows people to have different shapes. I mean, some smartphones use two batteries that are split into two, and they can charge both batteries at the same time to get this faster charging speed. So there's lots of tricks people can use, or smartphone makers can use, to uh, charge batteries in faster ways. Optus is rolling out Nokia's new integrated 5G antennas to make the 5G rollout faster across the country, and it's going to be using existing 4G tower technology to do it. Tell me about it all. Yeah, so look, when you've got the rollout to 5G and you've got new 5G antennas, the problem is that finding space on existing towers and rooftops for these new antenna equipment you know, poses a problem because you need more space for the antennas. You might need to pay for you know, more rooftop space that will raise the cost of your you know, rent for those particular space. And so the problem is having this new 5G antenna is taking up extra space that you don't want to be using. So what Nokia has done is that it has created a new antenna that works with both existing 4G frequencies and the new 5G frequencies and can be put into the same space. You can replace the existing antennas and you can replace it with this new antenna. So this means that the existing infrastructure that you're already paying for as a telco can be reused uh, with the upgraded antennas to deliver the existing 4G and 5G and this will speed up the rollout for 5G and uh, Nokia also wants this to be used used by other telcos. I'm sure Australia is a bit of a test case. The first place is in Brisbane, but they've put this the first site. So they'll clearly be putting this out in more sites. And all three of the telcos are trying to roll out 5G as quickly as they can. And they're also going to have to upgrade their uh, antennas to take advantage of the new millimeter wave bands that are had now authorized in Australia. And so being able to reuse the space you've already got while upgrading the equipment, saves on capital costs, saves on rental costs, lets you roll out 5G faster and everybody benefits. Tell me about the new COVID-19 killing Daleks. <laughs> well, SoftBank Robotics has a robot called Wiz and it looks like a non-threatening Dalek, sort of like you know a bigger version of R2-D2 without all the fancy look and feel of that particular robot. I've never thought of R2-D2 as being a Dalek, but you're right, it's there. <laughs> well, you know, it's a round tin can and uh, the Daleks had weapons 
Um, but even R two D two had the ability to to shock various aliens with with yeah, that, uh, you yeah, know. Sort I of, just never connected the two, but you're spot yeah, on. Yeah, well there you go. So this Wiz robot is kind of like a giant vacuum cleaner that can go around sanitizing surfaces and has been used in offices, in airports, in schools, and it's an autonomous AI driven robot. So it's, it's a little bit like an uh, industrial sized version of the Roomba or those That's what I was just know, thinking, AI yeah. robots in your home, but of course for much larger environments. And if you think about uh, if you've ever been to a shopping center, you know, late at night to go to the supermarket, you often see those guys sitting on those what look like giant lawnmowers, except they're scrubbing, you know, scrubbing the uh, tiled surfaces of or all those flat surfaces of the shopping center walkway. And so this doesn't require the human. And SoftBank Robotics, SoftBank is the big company from Japan that owns currently ARM, which they're trying to sell to NVIDIA, ARM being the architecture behind all of the smartphone chips that are very popular now in iPhones and Android. And uh, they own lots of different things, a huge company. And clearly, they've looked to the future and have invested in robotics. And they've partnered with an Australian company called Germ. Now, Germy, G-E-R-M-I-I, they have ultraviolet UVC technology. Now, UVC technology to sanitize and kill viruses and bacteria and sanitize services isn't new. It's been around for a long yep. time. There was a huge craze at the beginning of the pandemic to buy all these different sanitization boxes that can sanitize your phones and your masks and AirPods and keys and glasses. Well, they use this technology. Currently, they say they can, however they're doing it with their existing UVC devices, to sanitize the plane within 12 minutes and to sanitize a hotel room within five minutes. So they've merged this technology and added it to the Wiz robot so that it now doesn't just vacuum and use whatever cleaning solution, but can kill viruses and bacteria with this UVC light. And that is going to increase the confidence for people to go back into schools and offices and shopping centers and those sorts of environments where you know normally people gathered in large numbers without worrying about viruses. And this will also save on having people do these particular jobs if you can get a robot to do it and uh, do it in a much more you know thorough way and in the exact way every single time. That's going to be a good thing. That's Alex Zahara of Royd from ity.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 